Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 31st, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, Wyoming, another resource-heavy state, is dealing with its own budget crisis. Does its response show a way forward for Alaska as well? Second, with the primaries mostly over, we take a way too early look at where the next legislature may be headed on fiscal issues. Spoiler alert, it's mostly about getting to 16. And third, what the no side supporters avoid talking about when discussing Prop 1. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into the weekly top three this morning. I know you want to start off with some examples from down in the lower 48. We want to talk about the Wyoming approach. Let's uh, let's get into it, my friend. One of the things, Michael, I think that um, we've lacked in Alaska, uh, frankly, is as we've dealt with our fiscal situation, is a guide to how we get ourselves out of this. I, we we you know we we've internally talked a lot about need for spending cuts and how do we do that potential need for new revenues, how do we do that? Um, but we've sort of we've sort of dealt with it uh, in, in isolation. We, we've really sort of um, uh, tried to tried to find our own way in this situation without without there being a path out there that that that, that we can look to to see if others are dealing with it uh, in a similar situation. And I think I think we would benefit from having that path because I think it would be easier for our leaders to say that I'm going down a path somebody else has been down, um, and they've shown that it can be done. Uh, they've shown that these that these cuts can be made. They've they've shown you know they've dealt with the consequences, um, and I think it would be easier if we if we had a path out there. So um, one of the things we do is not only monitor Alaska's fiscal situation, but we also look at situations of states sort of similarly situated, similarly dependent on resource revenues in the lower 48 uh, from time to time to see how they're, how they're dealing with this, with this situation. And Wyoming um, uh, has sort of come up on the scene as, uh, as, as, as somebody who's really had to dig in and deal with, with uh, a similar situation to what we're facing, what we're facing up here. Wyoming uh, is, like Alaska, dependent on resource revenues, uh, mostly oil, but also gas. They have gas production there. They also have coal production there. Um, and with the, with the price collapse uh, that occurred uh, with the onset of, uh, of COVID uh, and uh, the, at the same time the, the Russian-Saudi uh, price war that went on for about a month that really took prices down, uh, that we haven't fully recovered or that we haven't recovered from uh, yet. Wyoming's had to face some of the same uh, issues we have. And, and, and I think it really would do listeners good uh, and government officials good, frankly, to occasionally Google uh, two words, Wyoming budget, and then look under, Google, under the news uh, section of Google, and you'll see article after article after article about, uh, about how Wyoming's dealing with this. Last week, the governor... Uh, of Wyoming, formerly the state treasurer, so somebody who's familiar with uh, with numbers, uh, the govern governor of Wyoming uh, uh, came to the uh, to, to sort of the come to Jesus moment for Wyoming, uh, and recognized that Wyoming's budget is going to be 30 percent short 
uh, in the uh, in the coming year. Huge numbers uh, for Wyoming, um, uh, and and Wyoming has sort of laid out a plan for how they're going to deal with that. Ten percent uh, cuts uh, to spending now. Uh, another ten percent cuts. Uh, to spending uh, uh, later uh, in this fiscal year uh, as they prepare for the new fiscal year, and then 10% uh, revenues uh, to new revenues to offset uh, uh, that uh, uh, to, to, to deal with the final uh, 10% of their, of their revenue shortfall. And as you can imagine, uh, even the first 10% has sort of led to, uh, I, I, I don't mean this word in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a physical sense, but sort of led to flash mobs. I mean, it's, it's, it's led to the same thing that, that Governor Dunleavy faced in Alaska when he announced the cuts uh, at the onset of, of his administration. But uh, Governor of, uh, of Wyoming is sort of just plowing ahead uh, and talking about these cuts uh, and dealing, dealing with these cuts, um, uh, the consequences of these cuts. I mean, his, his position is Wyoming doesn't have the same level of savings that Alaska did even as late as Governor Dunleavy's first term. So, you know, when Governor Dunleavy talked about cuts, people said, okay, yeah, we need need to make cuts or these are horrible cuts, but we always had savings to fall back on. Uh, the governor of Wyoming, Wyoming doesn't have that level of savings to fall back on, so they've really hit the wall. The same position that Alaska is going to find itself in this coming fiscal year now that we, right. now that we fully drain savings. Right. So I think, I, I think this, I think, what what Wyoming is doing here, the 10-10-10 plan, 10% cuts now, 10% cuts uh, announced uh, later in the fiscal year, and then 10% revenues, I think that is sort of a path. I'm not saying that Alaska has to adopt it uh, 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 wholeheartedly, but I think that's sort of the, a path that's being, that's being tromped out there that Alaska can look to and, uh, and sort of, you know, gauge – uh, how that works, and and look to it for some guidance on on how do we how we address our own situation. I'll tell you, in reading a couple articles about this, um, and uh, you know, in, in looking through this, I found some interesting things. You know, first and foremost, the governor laid out uh, 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 Governor Gordon laid out specifically the fact that I mean, he's not doing this because he wants to. There's a constitutional mandate that he is bal- his budget must be balanced, and since they have no savings to draw on. They can't just say, oh, we'll just pay it next year. We'll just kick it down the road. We'll just, there's just nothing to go to, uh, which I found interesting because Alaska has, you know, we're supposed to have a balanced budget. We've just been paying it out of savings. The legislatures just go, okay, yeah, hey, we got savings. We can make this balanced budget. We'll just do it here. But we are rapidly approaching that point of no return where there's just nothing left to do. So we're going to be facing the same situation. Um, but what I also found interesting was some of the parallels and in one of the articles. Uh, in part of his cuts is that uh, they were going to cut something like 274, 275 positions uh, out of state government. And everybody was up in arms until he said, well, that really only means like 20 layoffs, <laughs> 20 to 30 layoffs, something like that, which, again, just shows me that there is a habitual situation in government because we're facing the same thing. Tammy Wilson had pointed this out, uh, I don't know, 18 months ago, that there are hundreds, hundreds of unfilled funded positions in state government that have been bloating state government for how many years? I mean, they fund the position that they don't put a body in it, and then that money can be used in those budgets basically in whatever way they want. Uh, and we've got a similar situation. So, you know, don't tell me that there's not efficiencies in government that can't be found uh, because this is just another prime example. This is a this is an institutional problem in government where you're seeing this kind of buffing and, uh, uh, you know, kind of – uh, fudging of budgets as it goes through. It is, it is. But let's but let's be clear. That sort of gets him a little bit of the of the first ten percent, um, and and is is sort of uh, in in a sense free money uh, part of the first ten percent. But even the first ten percent is is the cuts are are, are having a real uh, a real effect. The cuts include an additional eighty million dollars in maintenance to state buildings and those at the University of Wyoming Community College, the University of Wyoming, you'll see its budget reduced by $42 million. Um, the Department of Health and Services facing an $11.8 million uh, cut. The Department of Corrections uh, projecting cuts of $22 million. Uh, parole agents, for example, required to supervise more offenders. Community college will have to do uh, without another uh, $25.7 million. 
I mean, there are, yes, the, the, the positions, not the unfilled positions, it's him part of the way to, and we're only talking about the first 10%, but, but, these, but there, there have to be additional real uh, uh, reductions in, uh, in spending uh, elsewhere uh, in the government uh, to do that. The, the, and, and again, this is the first 10% that Governor Gordon's facing. He's got another 10% to go. An important thing to understand about Alaska, Wyoming's facing a 30% uh, budget shortfall, and they're doing a 10-10-10 plan, 10% cuts first, 10% cuts, uh, uh, an additional 10% cuts uh, uh, later in the fiscal year, and then 10% in revenues. Alaska's budget shortfall is 50%. So if we do a similar third, a third, a third, which is frankly not a bad way to start thinking about how, how to break this up, uh, if we do a similar third, a third, a third, our thirds are going to have to be 17%, uh, 15% if you just want to you know, round it to the nearest, the nearest round number, 15% cuts, uh, immediate cuts, 15% additional cuts later in the fiscal year, and then 15% uh, uh, new revenues of some sort. Uh, to offset uh, to offset that last crunch, so Wyoming gives us gives us some example to look at of how of how other states are dealing, other resource dependent states uh, are dealing with uh, the situation. But Alaska situation is worse in the sense that uh, that our shortfall, our revenue shortfall against uh, against spending plus inflation is uh, is even deeper. Was Governor Dunleavy ahead of his time at this point? I mean, he 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 did what he promised. He uh, you know that's what he ran on. I think that's one of the reasons why he got elected was because he ran on a balancing the budget and 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 you know spending what we made and doing all that. But of course, as you said, we saw everybody come out of the woodwork. Was it just too early? Is now the right time? Uh, does he come out with a plan like this or something else? I mean, there's he doesn't have a Donna Arduin sent uh, you know si- sitting on his shoulder anymore offering sage advice on this so i mean what do you think happens i think i think what happened to dunleavy in all honesty is is the fact there were savings out there um uh, sort of undercutting i mean he said we need to we need to make these spending cuts uh we need to get our house back in fiscal back in order we need to get you know pfds restored um and and these are things we need to do but the fact there were savings out there and the fact that he had a legislature that that wasn't hesitant to cut the PFD, um, I think I think that undercut him. There wasn't. Um, my friends in D.C. are are fond of of, of talking about action forcing events. Uh, that is an event that you can't avoid, uh, and you have to deal with uh, in in terms of in terms of taking action. Um, and and a good example in the D.C. Uh, uh, realm in the federal realm. Is uh, is the end of the fiscal year? You have to have a new budget at the end of the fiscal year because you don't have you don't have authorization to spend beyond that. So, the budget uh, October first is always an action forcing action forcing event. I, I, the, 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 when you look back on it, I don't think I don't think Gun, Governor Dunleavy was was really backed up by an action forcing event because because a we still had savings. And and legislators could say, yeah, I know we should be cutting, but I don't want to cut this. And you know, we still got savings. And and to to some other degree, you know, there was the PFD and people in the legislature willing to cut the PFD. And so they could say, yeah, I know we ought to be cutting, we ought to get spending down. But you know, we got the PFD. We can just take money out of the. We can just tax the PFD instead and and keep this going. So, I, what what Governor Gordon is facing in Wyoming is an action forcing event. They don't have savings, right? And they don't they don't have they don't have a readily taxable revenue stream like the PFD, right? Uh, in, in order to avoid it, right? There's no more there is no more road to kick that can down. They don't have a road at all. We still have a little bit left, uh, but they haven't had that opportunity, so they have to do it the backs against the wall. Which I think is you know unfortunately, I think human nature states that's kind of where we have to get before some of these politicians would have had the will to do it. But maybe some of those changes that we've seen in the election will change some of that. Harold is always such a ray of sunshine. He says, all this talk, you're not going to get spending under control without reforming the spending formulas. I mean, I guess Brad has not been getting into the details of what his, you know, what this third, third, third thing would look like uh, specifically, but I think Brad has said in the past that absolutely spending formulas need to be opened up and taken a look at. 
Um, Harold says, because you need to know what you're spent, where you're spending before you can make proposals to make sensible reductions. I mean, Brad, I mean, that's obviously on the table. All these things have to be on the table, right? Yeah, Harold hasn't been listening to us since 2012. I mean, we, we've been through this. We've been through, you know, the need to look at uh, the, the, the K through 12 formula. We've been look, we, we've been through the need to look at, the, at Medicaid. We've been through the need to look at, at, uh, uh, at the university. Um, yeah, we've, 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 we've done all that. We've done all that continually. Um, and you know, we can go back through those shows if, if, if we need to sometime. Uh, but, but what you've got to get to is, is the will to make cuts before, before you get, before you get into the details of how you make those cuts, you've got to have the will to make cuts. Uh, and we've not had that. Um, and, and, and again, to go back to 2019, you know, the governor laid out a roadmap on how to make the cuts. Um, uh, $600 million in cuts, $400 million of, of, of revenue that was going to be upstream from, uh, from local government. He laid out a roadmap uh, on, on how to do that. And there was not the will uh, to, to carry through with it. Um, and so it's, it's the details. The details are important. And, you know, we can go back to all the shows we've done since 2012 uh, about, about what those details are. But what's even more important is the will to do it. Uh, the will to make the cuts, and 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 as I am, am, am increasingly focusing on as as we as we come into this era, uh, an action forcing event that 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 takes that will and translates it uh, into action, um, and that's you know we, we've got to have the will uh, along the way, and and I and I think part of the will, I think part of the will, part of people being willing to do this, is to see where it's been done someplace else. And to say yes, they did it, and yes, they survived. Wyoming as a state didn't collapse. Right. Uh, we, we've made they've made all these cuts, but it it continues to function. Yeah, and I and I think that's what I mean because the first thing we heard when the governor proposed his plan here in the state was, of course, you know, doom and gloom. We're all going to die. The words apocalyptic and draconian were thrown around with abandon. Um, I mean, literally, they thought that, you know, we that Alaska was going to somehow revert back to barbarism in the dark age. I mean, that was the implication from every opinion piece and and even, uh, you know, news stories written by reporters was that, uh, you know, this this was end of days kind of thing. Uh, And yet we've seen governments who have done it, who have lived through it. Uh, and, you know, I mean, Donna Ardwin, again, I, I, I hate to be a broken record and keep harping on that, but she's a woman that has gone through and for several states has done just that, had implemented cuts that, again, were were listed as being, you know, draconian and, and end of the world kind of scenarios. And yet she was able in a lot of those states to bring that stuff back. Was there pain? Absolutely. But was it the end of the world? Absolutely not. And unfortunately, again, he doesn't have her advice to, to help him through, but um, it's, uh, you know, it, it can be done. It can be done. And, and you know, the states that she addressed it in are, are not entirely similar to, to Alaska. I mean, Florida sure. uh, has its own source of revenues, has its own ups and downs. California, uh, the same. But what we've got with Wyoming is a state that looks very much like Alaska. Very, very rural, uh, with some pockets of uh, of, of urbanism. Uh, um, uh, very resource revenue driven uh, uh, college system that's driven by the University of Wyoming, um, and it looks a lot like uh, looks like a lot like Alaska. So I think we've we've got an example in what Governor Gordon's doing. He's sort of plowing the way. He has no choice. I mean, he has an action forcing event. He's he's, he's sort of plowing the way. In, in how you deal with this. And if you look at the Wyoming press, uh, which I would urge listeners to do, um, if you look at the Wyoming press, he's getting a lot of the same stories and a lot of the same comments that Governor Dunleavy got in 2019. The difference is in 2019, we still had savings and we had a legislature that was willing to tax the PFD um, uh, to, to, to avoid making those cuts. Um, and, and now we don't have the savings and hopefully we're getting to a legislature that whose knee jerk whose knee jerk reaction isn't uh, just to tax the PFD immediately. So I I, I, I really I I am hopeful that this administration starts saying, look, like Wyoming, we've got to do this. Like Wyoming is doing, we've got to we've got to go down the we've got to go down the same road. So that so that 
people understand, A, there are other people in other states in the, in the same situation right, as right. us, and B, that they're, that they're making progress on how to deal with it. Moving on to number two, uh, you know, we were talking about action-forcing events, and of course, uh, you know, this election was a, was a shock, I think, to many incumbents and many people who are part of the same old, you know, good old boys go along to get along club when they saw nine legislators get ousted. Um, many of them uh, thought to be, you know, in some ways, not necessarily untouchable, but solid in their positions. And we've seen a lot of it with most of the primary results back, uh, a couple of them pretty close. I mean, too close to call uh, outright at this point. Uh, Brad's going to hit us with number two, which is his way too early forecast on where next year's legislature is going to head on the uh, fiscal issue. Uh, Let's uh, talk about that here, Brad. Well, my my inspiration is uh, ESPN, and they usually run these way too early you know, projections of the top uh, of the top 25. And, you know, a- after a basketball season ends, they're, they're already making projections of what the top 25 for the next basketball season. And, and the title is usually way too early. And that's exactly what this is. This is a way too early um, uh, uh, conversation. But you, c- you can begin to see the outlines of, of, of how the legislature uh, comes together. There have been significant gains uh, by fiscal conservatives, um, uh, in, in terms of, of, uh, of defeating uh, Senator Giesel, in terms of defeating Representative Johnston, Representative uh, Kopp, uh, Ron Gillum winning the race, the Republican nomination in the race uh, down in the down in the Kenai, um, uh, Rob Myers uh, uh, running ahead of John Coghill with a with a recount to to, to occur tomorrow. Uh, you, there's been significant uh, inroads by conservatives. But when you when you run the numbers, uh, it's not over yet. Uh, you can put together. Uh, I do a chart that has uh, for for both the House and the Senate organized Republican uh, potential bipartisan and and Democrats, and the numbers are very close uh, in the Senate. And it really depends on on races uh, yet to be decided uh, in the fall. You've got. Uh, the, the three I've got highlighted right now is the is the Myers Eads race uh, up in Senate B, Myers Eads Sanford race up in Senate B uh, to hopefully replace John Coghill. Uh, you've got Rob Myers, the Republican nominee, Evan Eads, who's a who's an independent uh, conservative independent, and then you've got uh, Marna Sanford, uh, who is an independent but a Democrat leaning independent uh, up there. And that race is going to be that race is going to be tough. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Senate M, which is Josh Reback against Andy Holloman. Uh, the Democrat withdrew yesterday in that race. It's made it a clear two-person race between uh, Reback and Holloman, and that race is going to be tough. Right. And then in Senate P, uh, you've, I think we've got an opportunity. Um, uh, you've got uh, Gary, Gary Stevens survived the primary against John Cox, but if you look at the vote totals uh, down in Senate P, uh, Greg Madden, who ran as the AIP candidate, the Alaska Independence Party candidate, had more votes than either Stevens or Cox right. uh, uh, in the in the Republican uh, primary. Uh, and if you if you assume that the Cox vote is a is a no on Stevens vote, and that the Cox vote comes over to would come over to Madden, uh, that puts uh, that puts uh, Dr. Madden in a in a fairly strong position against uh, against Stevens. So. There, there are there are races that are yet to be uh, that, that are going to be important uh, in the fall uh, that are frankly going to determine uh, the outcome uh, of of where the organization is both on the Senate side and on the on the House side. If the if if Marna Sanford and Andy Holloman uh, and and Senator Stevens uh, 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 would win those races in the fall. Uh, there's a very good chance the Senate organizes uh, uh, as a as a bipartisan coalition. Um, if, uh, on the other hand, uh, Rob or Evan wins the the B race, uh, Josh wins the M race, uh, and and Madden wins the P race, uh, I think I think it's likely that the that the Senate organizes uh, uh, organizes Republican, and the House has the same sort of of races that are that are going to be still up in the air or going to be up in the air in the fall. That will determine its organization um, as well. The second, the second level uh, that I think is important to look at here 
is is whether there are 16 hardcore fiscal conservatives that are going to back Governor Dunleavy. I mean, the, the way to think about the legislature is is they're going to go through the budget process uh, if there is a bipartisan majority or if there's less than a strong fiscal conservative majority. Uh, the budget's going to likely be higher uh, than than we want it to be going into going into these fiscal circumstances we're facing. Uh, the governor uh, presumably would exercise his veto pen, and then the question is going to be: Are there 16 to uh, to back up back up those vetoes? That's really where the rubber meets the road, uh, and that's also going to be even getting to 16 uh, is going to be is going to be uh, uh, up in the air. I can get a hard. Uh, I think, based upon uh, the results of the primary and, uh, uh, and and looking at what the likely outcome is of of races in the fall, uh, without without counting those uh, those uh, ones that uh, I have up in the air, uh, but that's just fourteen. It's not sixteen. So right. getting to getting to sixteen is going to is I think is going to depend on on winning some of these races that are going to be are going to be tough runs. Um, and I and I and, and I don't think that we can just rest on our laurels and say, look, we defeated Giesel, we defeated Johnson, we defeated Cop, um, uh, we defeated. Hopefully, we defeated Coghill, and say, well, you know, we we we've, we've got it done. I, that's not that's not where we are. That's sort of phase one of getting it done. We have a hard road to go uh, still in the fall to get uh, to get phase two done and get a legislature uh, that in fact will. Uh, Either do it themselves uh, in terms of in terms of reforming our, our fiscal structure, or we'll at least back the governor up when the governor right. uh, makes cuts. So don't grow weary in well doing is your message here. Don't stop now. That's kind of what it all comes down to. Um, yeah, ex- exactly right. Uh, let's move on to number three. Uh, what some are urging uh, no on one. Uh, those some of those on the no on one side are overlooking. We got about uh, three and a half minutes here. Well. A lot of the debate you get into on on no on on Proposition One is you've got to defeat you've got to defeat uh, uh, Proposition One because it will it will decimate uh, the oil industry. As we discussed last week, at current prices at current oil prices, it doesn't do that. It raises costs about three percent, um, and that's not going to that's not going to force anybody to. Uh, 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 to, to leave the state or abandon uh, what are very good rocks uh, up here, uh, but you know, then then you get into the first part of the debate. Well, what if oil goes back to sixty dollars or seventy dollars, and some of these other provisions in the in uh, in Proposition One kicks in, uh, and uh, and and all of a sudden, you know, what you think is going to be an, an, an acceptable uh, level of cost increase uh, becomes uh, becomes an unacceptable level of cost increase. Um, and and you know you, you, that leads to a debate about oil prices, and, and and you know what the futures market is is saying, and, and what other expectations are about oil prices. But you always get somebody who says, "Yeah, but but what if?" Um, and here's the what if that uh, the, the answer to that what if that, that frankly the the no on one people, uh, the no on one side never wants to talk about, and that's what's in the Constitution. The Constitution says that an initiated law becomes effective 90 days after certification is not subject to be and may not be repealed by the legislature within two years of its effective date. And, and no on one, the, 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 the one people will, will always talk about that sentence and, and say that if you vote for proposition one, it's locked in. What they ignore is the very next sentence, uh, in the constant, in, in the constitution, article 11, section six, it says it may, and it refers to an initiated law. It may be amended at any time. Period. So, the, prop, the proposition, the, the law established by Proposition One, can't be repealed for two years, but it can be amended at any time. And and if there are changed circumstances, for example, if prices do, uh, for some reason, go up uh, to levels where it becomes problematic, or if there are provisions in Proposition One that are that are in, impeding uh, 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 yeah. the, the development of certain prospects, the legislature can step in and amend it uh, at any time. They can amend it next session 
right uh, to, to make it more uh, to make it more responsive so yeah i think this was a this was highlighted yesterday uh we had a conversation yesterday with mark myers i don't know if you uh watched or heard that brad um uh, on the uh, yes on one i thought it was an interesting conversation especially if you juxtapose, uh, juxtapose it uh with uh, the conversation with mike prax from the one alaska folks um earlier uh last week um i think that uh you know it 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 becomes more clear here what is uh you know i think what is going to be needed when you get people get into the voting booth on this uh on this proposition yeah you've got a lot of arm waving going on on both sides i mean you've got the 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 yes on one saying you know alaska deserves its fair share we've been ripped off by the oil companies i'm not sure that's right uh, the no on one said, you know, it's the end of end times. Uh, if we pass Proposition One, you know, investment's going to flee the state. Uh, uh, the decline curve's going to set in. We're going to become a wasteland uh, up here. There's just a huge amount of of arm waving on both sides. I, to me, you have to get into the facts, and you have to look at exactly what Prop One would do at the oil prices uh, uh, that that we're we're likely to face. Uh, in the in the near and indeed intermediate term, and the and the price increases, the cost increases, rather uh, from Prop One just aren't that big, and but more but as importantly, there's a failsafe. Uh, if something in Prop One does start significantly impeding uh, development in the state, uh, it, it, the Constitution says it may be amended uh, at any time. And in looking at the legislature that we're likely to have, I, I don't have much doubt that the legislature, that this legis- incoming legislature would step up and make the amendments necessary to ensure that, that there's investment, uh, continued investment in the state. So I, it, it, what Prop 1 really does is, is, is bring oil to the, to the bargaining table. Next legislature, we're going to have to address cuts and we're going to have to address revenues, just like Wyoming is. And it brings oil to the bargaining table. If we if we if we defeat Prop One, then oil goes. You know, we're we're out of here. We're excused from this discussion about about new revenues. You know, you took it to the to the to the people. The people voted against it. We don't think that we ought to be. We need to be part of the discussion. If Prop One does is enacted, then oil is part of the part of the table because we've got an action forcing event. We've got this. We've got this law that will kick in. That kicks in Prop One. Uh, that will that will significantly change or will change uh, uh, oil taxation. So it brings oil to the to the bargaining table, and I think that is that is probably the most important uh, aspect of Prop One. And then at the bargaining table, as part of an overall budget uh, reform, as part of overall fiscal reform, um, if Prop One needs to be amended as part of that, uh, it can be done. It, it can be included. Those amendments can be included. That's what the Constitution tells us. Uh, but I, but I think it's it's critical, as I've said a number of times in the past few weeks. I think it's critical that oil is part of the conversation, and the only way you can bring oil, you can you can have an action forcing event that brings oil in as part of the conversation is to pass Prop One. Um, let me I, again, in with the with fear here of repeating repeating ourselves again. But let me let me come back let me come back to this because again, this is the one reason I, I've stated publicly that I'm not I haven't decided yet on Prop One which way I'm voting. I'm leaning towards voting for it. But my biggest fear, uh, we've addressed it before, Brad. But I want you to address it again. My biggest fear is that in giving the legislature more money. We've just given them more road to kick the can down. That if they if they see more revenue, uh, they will instead of leaving the permanent fund alone uh, and put in you know and listening to what ICER said and what's been talked about for years that it has the largest adverse impact. They will see that new money as nothing more than just more things for them to spend, and it will take the pressure off them from the kind of the starve the beast mentality. Of cutting uh, of cutting government that they won't do it. What uh, you know? What prevents them from doing? And I think that's a big concern of many people is that if we give them more money, they will just spend it and then some. Well, Michael, I, I think we've got a governor that's just not going to do that. I mean, we, we we've got a fifty percent deficit. We've got a two point three billion dollar deficit uh, uh, that we're facing. The thought that somebody's going to raise spending from we're going to, they're going to use this revenue to raise spending from 4.6 billion to 4.8 billion uh, i think is just ridiculous i think i think governor dunleavy is a cap who puts a at, at least if nothing else and he's and he's certainly got 16 for this 
at least if nothing else says we're not spending any more. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna cap spending, and so once you cap spending, it's then about it's it's all about how are you dealing with the deficit, and and the deficit is dealt with. I mean, absent other revenues, the def- deficit is going to be dealt with entirely by uh, cutting, if not eliminating, uh, the PFD. Um, so Prop 1, revenues from Prop 1, revenues, oil revenues come in and reduce the, 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 the need uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to eliminate the PFD or to cut the PFD uh, as deeply. It, it substitutes revenues in for PFD revenues. But I think the ultimate protection against that concern about it's just going to be used to, to increase spending uh, is Governor Dunleavy. I, I, I cannot envision a circumstance uh, in which Governor Dunleavy would allow spending to go from 4.6 to, to uh, a higher number. And I cannot envision a circumstance uh, in which he wouldn't get 16 to, uh, to, to at least support that. So, I, I, yeah, it, it's like everything else with, with, uh, with the, the no on one. But what if? But what if? But what if? Uh, but you've got to you've got to de- you got to look at the details of of those what ifs to to see if they're realistic, and that one I just don't think is realistic. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board today. We appreciate Michael, it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Uh, good to hear from you. Uh, appreciate you coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.